How's it going? My name is Josiah Daniels. I am the associate opinion editor at Sojourners, but then I'm also just a fan of Gabby and Andrew's work. Um, and I am very glad today to be gathered together to be able to talk about their book, their ministry, and um, and the Psalms. So uh, I will hand it over now to Andrew and Gabby to introduce themselves. Um, but before I do that, just a quick uh, quick message about kind of what we are hoping to do here today. Um, so the way that I'm kind of envisioning this going is I have some questions that I would like to ask uh, specifically, again, about the book, ministry, uh, democratic socialists, and then also uh, like how to put a lot of this into practice. Um, so I'll ask those questions and then at the end, we will open it up for Q&A from all of you. You're more than welcome to put the uh, questions in the chat, um, or you can even come off mute. Um, but again, we are going to be doing that toward the end of our time together here. Um, and so now I'll hand it over to Andrew and Gabby to introduce themselves. Uh, again, happy that you all are here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josiah. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be with you all tonight. Um, I am Gabby Cudjo Wilkes. I'm one half of this writing team that has produced Songs for Black Lives. Um, it's just an honor to be with you all. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, uh, we are both clergy, um, but I also have a background in brand strategy and innovation. Um, we're based in Brooklyn, New York, and we're excited <laughs> about tonight's conversation. Absolutely. Um, uh, Andrew Wilkes, uh, the, the other half of the um, writing team uh, for Songs for Black Lives, uh, longtime uh, member of, of DSA. I, I joined in like 2014 um, and, and met uh, Maxine and, and uh, I'm sure a number of other folks here after writing a piece for uh, the Huffington Post called Towards a Socialist America uh, and really appreciate the work of um, DSA and religious socialism in particular of braiding together and weaving together uh, folks who are committed to um, fundamentally structural transformation, not only of our economy, not only of our society, uh, but also of uh, white supremacy, which is a primary mode of justification for so many of the things that um, add domination, add oppression, uh, and, and perhaps especially germane to uh, tonight's conversation that erode the, the spiritual and moral underpinnings of what it takes to, to flourish uh, in, in community. Uh, so super excited uh, for tonight's conversation and hopefully Songs for Black Lives can serve as a, a springboard in, into to some of those things. Yes, I also want to very quickly shout out our church, the Double Love Experience Church, the church that we founded together in Brooklyn uh, a few years ago. And uh, we canceled Bible study and told them to come here in place of our Bible study on Tuesday night. So some of them may be in the virtual room. So shout out to Double Love. We're back in your hands, Josiah, however you want us to fall. Okay, all right, well, let's get started. So the first question that I have is, uh, have for you guys is, how did this book come about? How did Psalms for Black Lives come about? Re really great question. Uh, so Psalms for Black Lives came about, um, if we can all remember back in uh, 2020, uh, at a time when um, the pandemic was um, uh, particularly raging, uh, even though I know there's still uh, a number of continuing difficulties and challenges folks are facing. Uh, and in New York, uh, it was particularly um, a, a brutal time, an uncertain time where, um, you know, there was quarantine, there were uh, so many cases of hospitalization and uh, deaths that were, were, were taking place, uh, just, just public health crisis, right, top, top to, to bottom. And um, in our congregation, um, we experienced, uh, as so many others uh, did, um, all of those 
drivers of angst, of anxiety head on. And a part of where uh, we turned uh, to um, is, the, is the ancient ever contemporary wellspring of uh, life, of, of vitality um, that, that the Psalms provides. And so we literally read and prayed the Psalms together for eight days straight, uh, paired it with civic action. Uh, so read a Psalm, reach out to your elected officials, get them to uh, respond to uh, some of the uh, swirling cauldron of uh, events happening around us uh, at that time, just four months in again to the pandemic. And as we um, got further into that process of engaging the Psalms and, and, and pairing it with uh, different kinds of advocacy, it dawned on us that um, it was taking among the congregation, maybe there might be an audience, a hunger for uh, these threads of spiritual renewal and social justice beyond uh, just solely uh, our congregation. Um, and uh, that is a part of the kind of trajectory that, that ended up leading to, to Songs for Black Lives. Yeah, all I would add is that um, when, we were, when we were trying to be supportive of our congregation and ourselves in the midst of the uncertainty of the pandemic, this is pre-vaccine, this is when you couldn't really gather with loved ones and elderly folks or people who are immunocompromised because, you know, you, you literally didn't want to have a super spreader event, right? So this is, this is August uh, 2020, um, and so it's, it's, just, it's just a very uncertain time. And so um, another part of how this came about was really looking to give people um, a slow down step-by-step -step approach to process their feelings and their emotions, um, which is why this book is in the form of a devotional, uh, because we really wanted people to be able to sit with the questions that we all were grappling with, and we wanted them to be able to root themselves back um, to scripture, but also to just process externally and slowly um, this kind of unforeseen climate um, that we found ourselves in um, across the world, not even just the nation, um, but certainly the uncertainty that was before everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you also to Maxine for dropping the link to the book in the chat there. The next question that I have is in the foreword to Psalms for Black Lives, Otis Moss III said this, uh, quote, the Psalms were not solely songs of praise, but poetry of triumph, tragedy, frustration, existential crisis, sorrow, heartbreak, and at times rage. What makes the Psalms important for us today? You kind of gave us the answer, I think, um, because I'm sure if we're honest, many of us feel all of the emotions that you just named. Um, I think the Psalms are an incredible place for us to remember that um, just in being human, there are so many conditions that we face that bring about these kinds of reactions um, and that we're not the first, you know, set of folks um, that had to grapple with these kinds of things and had to take those things to God. So I think um, now more than ever, um, the Psalms are incredibly relevant. I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I think the Psalms open up a wider continuum of um, emotional and interior life than, than we tend to, to talk about. Um, that is true on the, the personal level that the Psalms can function as a kind of uh, emotion will to help us move through grief, move through despondency, move through sorrow, uh, as well as jubilee, joy, like any good music. Uh, if you have Marvin Gaye, if you have uh, Nina Simone, if you have uh, Bob Dylan, if you have, um, uh, Lord have mercy, um, Brother Eminem, who, who was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recently, they, they help um, serve as a fulcrum to, to tap different aspects of your emotional life personally. But I think that's also true religiously and politically. Uh, you see the mint in the Psalms as both uh, something that's oriented um, towards God. Often, sometimes you also see the mint as a political skill, naming out the different grievances and points of frustration when uh, there's not enough food in the land, when there's oppression that's taking place, when political authority is acting uh, irresponsibly and inequitably. Um, and so the Psalms in that sense, I think, uh, widen the register beyond just uh, outrage at injustice and help us to tap into some of the creative ferment of, of sorrow with respect to injustice, of grief with respect to injustice, uh, and also of the sense of 
uh, what we talk about in the book as defiant confidence that we can run up against some of these systems uh, and generate some some collective results together. That's great. Um, defiant confidence. I think that's super important, uh, especially as you guys are saying, just right now in the midst of all the political turmoil, I think that people are looking for hope and inspiration. The question that I have for you is this, you know, is your book only for black people or is it for everyone? I think there's a, a rich sense in which um, through um, talking um, through the prism of, of Black lives, folks can can listen in and hear a word for their lives through the particularity and through the uh, the, the, the genius and the travails that, that Black lives experience uh, in much the same way that um, it's important for folks who are Christian to not uh, erase and have supersessionist readings of the Hebrew scriptures, but through the particularity of Jewish identity, you can hear a word that connects with and bridges to your own identity through hearing, um, um, and Gabby makes it this point often, through hearing a word that cuts through Black experience and not kind of smooshing Black experience into a kind of BIPOC amalgamation that kind of erases and unmoors Blackness. Um, I think we can hear about a rich tradition of, um, of, 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 of Black socialism, much of which have been generated in religious context. Uh, Katie Cannon's uh, work, I think of the last chapter in Womanism and the Soul of Community, where she's looking at Oliver Cox, she's looking at race, class, and gender. Uh, you think of um, the work, certainly, of a George Washington Wood Bay, of a, of a, of a Cornell West. We could, we could go on and on. And, and it, in a certain sense, uh, I think Songs for, for Black Lives uh, helps to work within and um, contribute uh, to that tradition. Yeah. Um, and, and I would add, uh, in the same way that we saw um, white supremacy on display on January 6th, um, in the same way that we've heard a lot of rhetoric cloaked in religious language, um, but really it's about... Uh, the, the construct of whiteness and what they believe is supreme um, as opposed to uh, just who we are as individuals and as people. In the same way, um, many of our churches have taken on um, that approach to interpreting scripture. Uh, and a lot of black folks, especially when, in, within the time of the, of the pandemic, um, were really asking questions about where is God asking questions about what does God have to say to me? Because even though the pandemic was horrific for everyone, black and brown people were still disproportionately being impacted to a greater extent because we had pre-existing conditions, whether they be related to our health, whether they be related to our socioeconomic status, whether they be related to where we live, um, what options we have, uh, what discretionary income we have, uh, what discrimination we faced. Um, and then, you know, to a, a month and a half into the pandemic, we've got George Floyd being killed and mass protests um, across the nation yeah. um, in response to this kind of what folks decided to call a racial reckoning. Um, and so there's all of this stuff happening um, against Black lives. And so it was very important for us to create a theological resource that's rooted in devotion mm -hmm. that is explicitly named for Black lives in a time where Black folks could not trust every person, to keep it blunt, every white person who called themselves a Christian. Because we saw on the news and we saw in our interpersonal encounters, the same way we saw all those years ago with KKK folks wearing masks and wearing, wearing hoods and teaching Sunday school and burning crosses, we saw that there is sometimes a disconnect and an incongruity between what white supremacy wants to do with the Bible and what everybody else needs the Bible to do for us. Um, and so we've been very, very clear um, that this work... Uh, is for those folks um, who felt like they couldn't see or trust uh, the church or its leaders. Um, and for whomever else it impacts, uh, that's a blessing, that's icing on the cake. Uh, but we have a heart for that population and at that time wanted to say something very specifically to that population. Absolutely. That's great, that's great. So you've talked about who the book impacts, uh, which I think is 
phenomenal. Who are some of the authors and artists who have influenced this book? Hmm. I'll, I'll give you some folks who have influenced uh, me as an individual, and that might spill over into influencing the book. Um, but certainly, I mean, one of the folks that I think about, um, someone who writes with intentionality for Black lives, but it can be experienced and enjoyed by all, someone like Toni Morrison, um, who, uh, you know, a great American novelist, um, but always intentionally told uh, stories of Black life and Black culture. Um, definitely a music artist uh, that decide to uplift the, the ebbs and flows, the nuances of life, to still find a smile, to still find joy, but to not hide um, away from what's actually going on. And we see that all throughout gospel, all throughout the blues, all throughout jazz. Um, so I'll, I'll start there, but um, definitely, Andrew, please share. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a uh, the hope that what um, Songs for Black Lives could accomplish, and, and then we'll, we'll kind of take the scenic route to, to your, your question, Josiah, is um, to create a space for contemplation and serenity that doesn't swim with the tide of being depoliticized and inhale and exhale, get a little bit of centering, and then go back to oppression as usual, go back to, um, you know, steamrolling over communities and driving gentrification, go back to the business of, uh, it's been a few months after 2020, get rid of the Black Lives Matter signs, take them out of the window. Some, sometimes meditation and spirituality is kind of a, a garnish to kind of grease the wheels of empire and grease the wheels of extraction and exploitation. So the hope is how can we have something that can cultivate the resources of the interior life while also pushing for a deep sense of justice uh, within uh, the genre of contemplation and devotion. And I, I think at its best, I think Songs for Black Lives uh, does that and, and is um, in that sense kind of moving within a stream of um, work that includes your your Howard Thurman's um, with you know resources like Jesus and the Disinherited, um, meditations for apostles of sensitiveness, uh, but also folks like Barbara Holmes who talks about the contemplative traditions of, of the Black church and connect um, uh, thoughts and prayers. Maybe I put it another way, thoughts and prayers isn't an escape from the world and an escape from responsibility, but thoughts and prayers can actually be the seedlings and the kindlings uh, for rebellion, for deep structural change, and for pushing uh, towards a more uh, socialist political context. How do thoughts and prayers help us form what you guys talk about as a justice imagination? How do thoughts and prayers help us form a justice imagination? Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll separate thoughts and prayers from the kind of mass response that we give people when tragedy strikes. Um, and I'll more so locate us in what is our thought life and what is our prayer life doing and accomplishing? Um, because I think those are two different things. Um, I think when we say thoughts and prayers, it's usually a knee-jerk response to some sort of tragedy. We write it on somebody's you know, social media page, we text it to them, and we go on about our business, most of us. Um, so I don't think that cultivates much of a justice imagination. I think it's just a response that is culturally acceptable and it's a way to just not be a jerk, quite frankly, when somebody's had something horrible happen to them. Um, but our thought life, and our prayer life certainly can be cultivated by the resources that we feed it. And that can help to cultivate what we call a justice imagination. And so all throughout our book, we talk about this concept of a justice imagination, where we want to help embolden people's capacity to be believe and dream that justice is still possible, even in the face of countless injustices. And one of the ways that we believe that one can do that is through um, your internal uh, interior life, uh, your spiritual interior life, but also your collective and communal spiritual life. Uh, mm -hmm. Because while we are individuals, we exist in community. And so it's not enough to build up oneself interior, your interior life and to build up oneself internally about possibilities 
if you're not also able to go out into the world and link arms with folks who also want to try to bring those realities to life. Um, so it's not just individual, it's also communal. Uh, but there is a way in which uh, we can feed our mind with different thoughts. We can feed our mind with different possibilities. We can look at the news and get really clear about what we are facing and then go to our prayer closet, as we say in my tradition, and pray for something different, right? That's a way of cultivating our justice imagination. Um, we're very clear that justice imagination does not happen on the backs of closing our eyes or imagining that the world that we live in is not real, that we don't think is healthy. Um, and so when folks say, you know, I don't see any issues, I don't see this, I don't see that, I only see heaven, I only see heaven on earth, I only see what God has for me. I don't think that's healthy. I think we have to see, we have to be able to face exactly what is before us. But when we cultivate a justice imagination through cultivating our thought life and our prayer life, we're able to still think about different responses or different approaches to solving the same issues that have plagued us for generations. Uh, uh, absolutely. What, what, one way of, of, of putting the question is, what what, do, what is entailed in envisioning a America that cuts beyond the sordid legacies of the Jim Crow South, of convict leasing, of sharecropping, of the, the worst of... Um, shadow slavery and its afterlife. What what kind of piety does it take to envision um, a world beyond um, apartheid, um, legally backed, uh, normatively backed, sanctioned in South Africa? What, what, what kind of piety does it take to um, move beyond the, the caste system and how the, the dollar community is treated in, in, in India? A, a part of what um, the Psalms do is cultivate this sense of um, what is, what what could be um, through the eyes of faith in direct contradiction to what is. Uh, so often injustice appears naturalized and cemented and crystallized as just the, the way things is. It, it, it may just appear to be the case that um, chambers of commerce and real estate uh, communities will just dominate and dictate what we do with every plot and parcel of industrial real estate, residential real estate, commercial real estate, the waterfront, where we put uh, waste to energy plants in our community, that, that we just have to receive those things. And the power imbalances are just something that we just kind of take and absorb. Um, but when we see um, a psalmist asking, why does the wicked prosper? When we see um, claims like the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the people and all they that dwell therein, that, that begins to push against the kind of long settled under questioned claims of private property. And those who have uh, what they may presume to be titled uh, to hoard and cluster uh, all of the, the nice things of, of, of the world, when in fact, uh, they are not the ones who create and curate those, those things. Um, hopefully the, the, the Psalms come as, as a resource there. And so uh, maybe in, in, in a word, I think a, a justice imagination helps us to see uh, that we each have um, generative capacity and genius uh, to, to see and to surmise a world beyond the accepted contours that an imperialist, capitalist, uh, patriarchal system meets out to us and then tries to sugar it over with a, a God bless America and, and in God we trust on the legal tender. Right, yeah, that's... I think that's uh, spot on. Something that you were saying, Gabby, uh, you were talking about interior life, and that brought a question to mind. Why should people involved with DSA care about their interior lives? Yeah, um, that's a big part of why we wrote this book because so many folks who are committed to the work of liberation and justice um, have gotten so, um, so aware of the issues that we're fighting, that we're facing, that we don't always make space to check back in with ourselves about our own whys, why we're committed to this work, 
what it is about it that keeps us going, um, what refreshes us, what do we need? When are we burned out? When do we need to, you know, ask somebody else to pinch hit for us because we're not at our best? Um, and so I think it's important for DSA folks and anyone who's doing the work of liberation um, to be attentive to your own interior life um, because we can get jaded and not realize it. We can get into unhealthy patterns and not realize it. We can have savior complexes where we think we're the only people that can make a difference and not realize it. Um, we can really get ourselves back into some corners and not even recognize that the way that we're operating and functioning is no longer healthy. It might be very far from what got us started in the work in the first place. And I don't believe that you can really have a good sense of that uh, or a good, a good metric of how you're doing if you're not being attentive to your own interior life. And so I think that the, the commitment to interior life is to ask yourself hard questions mm -hmm. and to answer honestly, which is why each day of our devotional has hard questions. It has the kind of questions where folks have told us they got stuck on one question for a week. Because if you're really answering these questions honestly, there should be some transformation happening internally about how you see the world. We're not always right. Sometimes we need other perspectives. Sometimes we need to recognize that what we're doing in our approach is outdated and we didn't realize it because we never slowed up to check in mm. um, and so many other reasons. So um, it's critical. It, it's necessary. That's such a, a, a great question. Uh, and with, um, echo everything Gabby said about um, it being critical and necessary to pay attention to our interior lives. Um, if, if every movement, um, whether it be the movement for Black Lives, whether it be DSA, whether it be the Poor People's Campaign, whether it be the labor movement, those organizing at uh, Amazon warehouses and uh, bless the Lord that we're getting pumpkin spice lattes from more and more unionized Starbucks. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for, for that. Tis the season to, to organize. Uh, it, it, every movement has songs, has stories, has symbols, and a sense of the sacred. Can, can you imagine the labor movement without people singing, you know, solidarity forever? Uh, can we imagine the nexus of We Shall Overcome, not only being a civil rights anthem, but also a labor movement anthem? And then there's just a blunt reason that so much of what is pushed for in structurally shifting radical politics uh, in the racial orient wings of, of churches, of mosques, and synagogues. And the push for gain traction you want. What do you do when uh, the Green New Deal, the public bank, the community land trust, another attempt to um, folks freedom of association and, and collective bargaining is dashed? That, that there has to be some kind of uh, song, some kind of story, some kind of symbol that cuts beyond the typical, not all, but some renderings of historical materialism. Uh, and I think there's a kind of uh, enchantment, a kind of inspirited sort of materialism that uh, is a contribution that the Psalms and that folks of faith can bring uh, alongside uh, folks of goodwill and of conscience that, that are doing this work. Yeah. And to that point, I would just add, sometimes you need something to build you back up because you've been, tell, been told no all day, every day. You've been getting doors slapped, you know, slammed in your face. You've had appointments when you went to go lobby and they acted like you weren't on the list or, you know, you've been pushing for something that, you know, you thought you had a group of 50 who were going to show and two people show and you still have to do the work. Like there's a lot of things that that impact our interior life when doing the work of liberation um, mm -hmm. that we often just brush past. And um we, we owe ourselves to do more than just brush past those moments, um, but to really interrogate those moments. That's great. I have a few more questions that I wanna ask. Uh, we probably have about maybe 10 more minutes before we should transition to the Q&A portion. Um, one of the questions that I want to ask is how does this book break the mold of what is typically considered to be a devotional? That's a really good question. And I think a, a number of devotionals, um, so some devotionals that, that I have 
uh, scene and uh, at, at um, in initial beginning stages of my um, walk of, of Christian faith have been, um, let's see how, how, how to put it, uh, creating like a kind of castle and chamber of inward um, connection and orientation to, to God that, that may spiral outward in a good deed, that may uh, lead one to be concerned, understandably, uh, but incompletely about questions of interpersonal forgiveness, about questions of um, maybe within the family, a, a context of even-handed equal treatment, uh, but, but you almost don't get the sense that society exists or that uh, other contexts outside of one's particular nation state exists. Um, um, I don't know if these names ring any bells to folks, but um, a lot of what um, th there were uh, titles like uh, My Upmost for His Highest and uh, Streams in the Desert and all of these other kinds of um, and, and, uh, our, our daily bread, noble entries that um, I think, as Gabby powerfully said, provide a sense of um, building oneself up when you hear no all day, that, that should be applauded, that should be affirmed. And yet uh, there, there's got to be a bridge beyond just solely um, individualized forms of spirituality that can become individualistic, that can become me only, that can actually reinforce the isolation and alienation instead of the spirit of assembly and coalescing ourselves together for, for change. This is going to be uh, the last question here for now, and then we can start transitioning to Q&A. How does Psalm, Psalms for Black Lives decolonize the contemplative tradition? I don't know if the contemplative tradition has been colonized. Um, there are a lot of contemplatives um, of varying races. So I don't. I don't know that I... Uh, agree with the premise, but I do think it's important to continually push ourselves um, to think deeply and outside of the constructs um, that marginalized folks uh, are often pushed into. That that's how I would answer that. Uh, uh, it's it's a um, th there's a, a mixture um, exactly as as as, as Gabby said of of contemplative. Uh, traditions for absolutely a, a lot of what comes from um you know we, we, we're together as family we might as well be spe specific a lot of what comes from the word network from tbn from lifeway christian stores from berean stores uh, from a place where i used to, to work and that at a certain point my journey was profoundly impactful family christian stores Th this presents a kind of um positive thinking american flag enveloping vision of um, Christian faith that is probably applauding <laughs> the fact that President Trump is running for office again in 2024. This, this, this is an answered prayer to half the country. And th th there's no, it, it can be easy to say that, um, you know, my Christianity and their Christianity are different, but but the Christianity is a messy tradition. Um, and I mean, we, we all saw the election results on, on Tuesday. Um, so I think a, a part of what, um, and in, in every uh, uh, book is, is an imperfect entry uh, as, as this song for Black Lives, but I think what um, is rich and powerful in the tradition in which we, we are kind of locating ourselves um, is that tradition that um, Howard Thurman has, has a quote where he talks about um, the power of, um, uh, Black uh, Christians to uh, redeem um, a tradition that was profaned in their midst. And then the, the Brush Harbor, uh, down by the Riverside tradition of uh, Black social Christianity that emerges not tabula rasa in the low country of the Southeastern United States, uh, but you know brings those retentions from West Africa and, and congeals into a, a kind of uh, unique contribution is, is where um, uh, Songs for Black Lives in some ways kind of finds its, its moorings. That's great. 
thank you both so much and we're not done by any means um but i did want to open it up for questions again you uh, can come off mute and ask a question or you can also put a question in the chat And perhaps while we're waiting, I will ask uh, one more. Actually, we got a question right here from Maxine. Perfect. Uh, were there particular Psalms that spoke more forcefully to you as you wrote the book? I think the Psalms, any Psalms that dealt with lament um, spoke differently to me um, in this process because you know, this, this, the, the place that we found ourselves in seemed incredibly hopeless. Um, I think I found more hope in the past couple of years, now that we can gather again to some, some extent with, with safety, um, you know, now that other, other norms and other rhythms, but um, the Psalms that are just plain, that, that are just talking to God, like, <laughs> God, how'd you let this happen? You know, th those are the, those are the ones that I found refuge in because, um, you know, there's a there's a very large um, subset of folks who are just done with the church. And as pastors, um, we have to be the same way I said, you can't hide behind, you know, not looking at the news, you know, as pastors, we can't hide behind not looking at the trends. And um, being pastors in New York means that we are even more aware of how many folks are just done with the church. And many of them are done with the church and conversations that we have with people because they felt like the church just was not confronting what was happening um, in their actual day-to-day -day lives, that that they would walk in on a Sunday and it would, you know, act like the world was perfect uh, when they're coming in, you know, really dealing with um, any number of issues. And so um, what was healing for me was to remember um, that we have precedent for lament. We have precedent for complaint. We have precedent for incongruities. We have a we have precedent for hopelessness, um, and that it is not it does not have to be disconnected from our Christian profession of faith, um, but that it can be uh, one of the very things that makes our faith more organic um, and and more true and more authentic. Um, and so, for me, um, in a very low in a very communally low place, um, I found a lot of encouragement um, and reminders. Um, that we've we've been here before in, in some instance in terms of the ways um, that that the pandemic was weighing on um, our souls and just our, our, our way of knowing what our next day would be and what it would look like. It's such a, a great question. We did briefly say um, Psalm 88 um, is a particular favorite um, of, of mine, it, it starts off with a prayer addressed to God, and then it uh, concludes without making the typical turn back to God as the other 149 Psalms do. Um, it ends saying, trouble surrounds me and darkness is my only companion. Uh, and this um, unresolved, um, unalloyed uh, entry into the depths of agony, of angst, of despair, um, to see that that has a, a place in the um, the pages of scripture, um, I think speaks to and, and helps to acknowledge um, that that life is not always a crystal stair, right? In the, in the language of, of Langston Hughes, and so I, I think that also speaks to the fact that our our movements are not always expanding. That there's a big push to get to a uh, hundred thousand members for, for DSA, but we, we may not have seen the kind of surge after this. Uh, election cycle as after some of the Sanders campaigns and after uh, some of the initial kind of seating of the squad uh, for so forth. Um, so, so yeah, we, we lift up Psalm uh, 88 for how it gives space to the blue notes. That's great. Uh, Ralph McCoy, I believe Ralph has a question. I do not have power to unmute people, but I do just want to say Ralph has a question. Yeah, thank you guys for for sharing. And um, I think you talk about this a little bit in the book. Um, but I wondered if you could talk to 
um, just the role that as you know, as the Psalms are a song book, um, a you know work of of poetry and creativity. Just what is uh, the importance of having um, music and creative spaces for um, communities to be able to express just the the depth of emotion? Um, and I guess that's a philosophical question, but also practically, like what does that look like for your own local church community and um, yeah, I would love love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, sorry, we were having difficulty toggling with the mute button. Um, I think your question is is what is the role of of music? Would you mind restating it? Just I was a little distracted because I was trying to unmute. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, just uh, the role of music and. Uh, even just like other creative expression beyond just uh, dialogue, which is like an amazing part of expressing, but what uh, are some other forms of creative expression that allows for uh, just the depth of emotion that you see in the Psalms that you, maybe you don't feel in something like Proverbs or okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, other, other forms of, of uh, dialogue, yeah. Got you, got you, got you. I mean, I definitely think you nailed it with poetry and with music in particular, um, you know, with the Psalms being a sort of song book. Um, I definitely think that we can express ourselves um, through the arts in ways um, that really, that really um, transcend um, other forms of communication. Um, so that's what I would say, but what would you say? One song we, we often sing, um, certainly uh, during every Black History Month, uh, but it's a song that's fitting uh, for every uh, month, is um, the iconic James Weldon Johnson song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, Till Earth and Heaven Ring, Ring with the Harmonies of, of, of Liberty. Uh, I, I could go through the all three verses, but I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, uh, except to say that, um, it, 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 Ralph, I, I think um, music expresses a register of joy and discontent in ways that create more front doors sometimes than um, maybe the Proverbs does, or then maybe some of the, um, uh, the then, uh, then, then capital and all of its volumes, then, then uh, various manifestos, right? Uh, and, and pamphlets, which are important, which have their place. Uh, but which should not be the only form of information, content, and interest into um, contention. Um, so, so lift, lift every voice and sing is certainly one uh, piece. But, but also, I think there's something to be said for just ritual gen generally and community repetition and uh, sharing a sense of of life together that way. One, one of the things that we say. Um, every Sunday as a part of our mission and vision, we, we talk about creating an, an equitable economy for, for all of God's creation. Uh, and that sense of uh, continually affirming who we are, what we intend to do and what we believe is, is God's kind of love and justice intention for the world, I think helps to kind of center us as a form of kind of confession and affirmation in a way that's different than just solely analysis. Rebecca, Rebecca Truland, I believe Rebecca has a question next. Hi, good evening. Thank you for spending time with us tonight. Um, my name is Rebecca. I'm a Lutheran pastor, and my question might overlap with Ralph's a little bit, for which I apologize. Um, as I was listening, I was um, uh, thinking about ways to kind of include this contextualization and utilization of the Psalms with um, corporate worship settings like Sunday morning or other liturgical events, in addition to personal devotion or small groups or some such. Um, and it, it even kind of reads almost like a preacher's commentary in some ways, the book. Um, so that's an obvious place I could think of, of using um, it for such, a, such an event. But I was wondering if you've done anything else or if there are principles to this kind of approach that you have used or any kind of um, wisdom you have to share along those lines of um, also bringing this into a corporate worship liturgical setting? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we, we did an experiment last week. Uh, we were on the campus of Duke University and were invited to preach their chapel service 
And um, they are one of those congregations that ask for your title really early. Um, and, and so uh, we were feeling the pressure to get them our title and our scripture. And then we were doing a conversation facilitated with one of their professors afterwards on the book already. And so they kind of made a joke and they were like, you're probably going to preach on the Psalms, right? And we're like, yeah, yeah, you know, banter, banter, banter. And, you know, in reality, we were still kind of sitting with what we wanted to preach through. So we ended up uh, preaching. Uh, we gave them the title of our sermon as the title of day one in our devotional, uh, which is Defying Confidence. And we preached from that scripture. And in a way, it almost made our devotional like a lectionary. Um, and so I would offer that. Uh, this is something that we kind of stumbled into last week. But in a sense, uh, it could also be approached as a lectionary um, where you've already got the Psalms in front of you. They're given to you in their entirety. Um, we have our perspective on them, but you could preach your own perspective. Um, and yes, then our responses and our reflections could be kind of almost consulted like a commentary of sorts. Um, there's also some churches that use their bulletins um, more interactively. And so, you know, you might put a question or two from Songs for Black Lives in the bulletin as a question of the week or something to reflect on. Um, and then uh, to Ralph's point, there are a lot of songs that are literally the verses of psalms. And so, you know, um, it might show up in uh, your worship ministry or worship band or praise and worship teams, um, selections of songs for the day. You might give them a particular psalm and, and just uh, encourage them to find uh, songs that have already been written um, that are literally the, the lyrics to some of these psalms. So those are a few ways you could get it, get it uh, active in your environment. You're welcome. Robert E. Hansen. Robert, you have a question. Yeah, it's Bob. <laughs> um, really appreciate your book. Um, I'm also a retired Lutheran pastor, but also a practitioner of Zen Buddhism. And a uh, retired Navy chaplain from the Vietnam time. And I have a question. Uh, I, I know that the Psalms have, there are, there are scholars now that are saying that many of the Psalms have a Persian influence in their poetry, which, which I think sometimes adds to the value of those Psalms. But also I'm wondering <clears throat> how this, fits with other traditions uh, who are not, uh, who do not confess or, or live within the story of Jesus or the Christian story. I guess most of the world would be in that case. And also because we're in such a diverse and interreligious world right now, or at least we're more conscious of that than we've ever been. I wasn't conscious of it when I was brought up, <laughs> but I've become conscious of it. Uh, and also, another community that often gets left out because we're, we sometimes drink too much Kool-Aid is the veterans community. And uh, I, I have coffee with a bunch of my buddies every morning, almost every morning. And uh, they left God in the, on the battlefield in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, and I, <laughs> they all know that I was a chaplain, but and I, mostly what I did was bury people when they got back from Vietnam. But, um, and we're working on the suicide thing a lot. So, you know, you, I think the Psalms really are, uh, to me, a universal style of script, of literature as well as spirituality. And so I, I just wonder how you relate to other traditions where they are not, uh, they are not living out that the same story as maybe you and I. That's a really rich question. I, I think the, the Psalms, um, certainly um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, are, I think 
as they are generally experienced are uh, intrinsically in a faith tradition. When, when Christians reach for the Psalm, they're reaching for what's being curated by, by Jewish folks. So there's no way that we're not talking about at least two religious traditions that at minimal that, that are kind of sharing your, your point about um, uh, the, the influence of uh, not only folks uh, in Persian context, but th there's a lot of uh, influence that then one could say certainly from um, North African and uh, Egyptian context in much of the sapiential literature of, of, of scripture. Um, so so I, I think that's rich and, and only uh, enhances the experience of the Psalms. And so um, while there is, I think, a rich uh, universal import to the Psalms, it comes from a particular place that I think we have to kind of recognize and grab that kind of rootage and that particularity. Um, and, and I think that that only um, enhances it all, all the more. Uh, the, the other thing I, I would note, recognizing what you said about um, uh, Buddhist context, I, I think there's a really rich tradition of spirituality that's rooted in love, that's deeply conversant with the Psalms, uh, as well as deeply conversant with Buddhist traditions. And I think as the, as the primary example, though not the only example, that of uh, the late Bell Hooks uh, in her love trilogy, um, all about love, salvation, communion, she talks over and over about how both of those traditions kind of deeply form uh, who she is and, and how she kind of shows up in the world. So I, I think there's space for um, multiple front doors of entering to the Psalms. And, and certainly as a, uh, as a Christian pastor, I, I appreciate uh, that Jesus dies with a Psalm on his lips, right? There, there's a deep embrace of the Psalms to celebrate life, to celebrate going through the valley of the shadow of death to celebrate children being an inheritance from the Lord and to celebrate um, God working justice for those who are oppressed. Those are, um, there's some strands and strings we can all hold on to there for sure. We probably have time for a few more questions. I do uh, want to be conscientious of time here. Uh, Jim Morganson, or rather Jim, Jim Mogensen, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly there, Jim. There we go. So, um, so it, as it just happened in the midst of all the, all the Zoom calls and all the interaction, I was uh, reaching out to a local Quaker in Ann Arbor who has been writing his own modern Psalms on social justice issues. So is it Dwight Wilson? So I don't know if people are familiar with him, but he, but anyway, so, so now I have three books to read, two of his <laughs> books and now yours <laughs> at the same time. So is it my understanding you were taking the ancient Psalms and then building things around that, or are you writing your own new modern Psalms? In oh, great context? question. Um, not rewriting, um, simply reflecting. All right, thank you, Jim. Um, we have a few uh, questions that have been put in the chat and I'm gonna kind of do a dealer's choice here. Uh, there are two questions that are that are kind of similar to me. Um, there's a squeamish, squeamishness around the psalm sometimes and I think that's because a lot of it has to do with sort of like the raw emotionality of the human condition. Um, and then I think specifically too within Christianity, there can be an avoidance of the imprecatory Psalms. How did those imprecatory Psalms, the Psalms where people are praying that God judge other people, how did those Psalms influence <coughs> your guys' work? Yeah. Let's start. Yeah. Um very grateful for the question um and grateful uh for um i see um, among other places i see brandon in, in particular it seems lifting up some di dimensions of, of of that um I, I think the imprecatory psalms invite us to continually be um reflective and have some metacognition in our faith to think about what we think about as as, as we're praying um which is important because they, they invite us to sit with the dimensions of rage, the emotions of 
um, wanting the hammer to fall down on, on, on those who are causing in, in, injustice and, and without creating space to not just analyze and critique, uh, but to emote, to mourn, to roar uh, <laughs> against injustice, imperialism, and white supremacy. We, we have a, we accept the uh, partitioning of ourselves into little pieces. And so the sensuality of the Psalms um, to, to bring uh, Audre Lorde into the conversation, uh, who's always a, a, a relevant theorist, the erotic is a source of power. And the Psalms help us to name the, the often suppressed, embarrassed uh, theological and political emotions as a source of raw efficacy, power, and instrumentality that is important in its own terms. But when we give space for that uh, in congregations and communities, um, it, it can shake things up in a, in a rich way. Yeah, uh, a lot of churches, a lot of clergy, a lot of leaders, a lot of lay people are mm -hmm. uncomfortable with problems that they don't have a quick solution to, just in general. Because if they don't have a quick solution to it, Reverend Isis from my church is in the chat. So glad you're here, Reverend Isis. I appreciate the amen corner. We need it. Um, and so, you know, a lot of churches, if they don't have the answer already, they don't want to preach it. They don't want to bring it up for Bible study. They don't want to have that conversation because they think that that means that they lose their sense of spiritual authority or that they will look like they haven't prayed enough or they're not deeply connected enough to God because they don't have the full picture, right? But no prophet at any time has ever had the full picture. Anybody that you love, that you follow, mm. has never had the full picture. Even Jesus in his humanity was asking questions of God the Father, like, yo, can you clarify this for me? I'm sorry, I went to my vernacular that I do at my church. But basically, nobody has ever had the answers. So we did a disservice in American Christianity when we acted like we had every answer to every problem. How do you have the answer to every problem? By simplifying the problems, right? When you, when you get rid of the why questions, when you get rid of the how questions, when you hmm. silence people, when you, when you uh, lessen their scope, then all those questions you can answer, all those sermons you can preach. But that is a thin level of Christianity and of faith. And I think that what finally happened between 2020 and 2022 is that a lot of people who have been lying to themselves that they were okay, that their problems were not systemic, mm -hmm. that their problems were not collective, could not lie anymore. And people were then hungry for spaces, which is why they would go to church on YouTube, wherever they could get the kind of sermon that would speak to what they were dealing with, right? Because people were hungry for, what do I do now? People were living in precatory songs. Mm. And so I think that we've always had a need to deal with this, but I think we strayed away from it as the church universal in trying to give people very neat and simple solutions to very big problems. Um, and so my hope is that we lean into some of this new willingness to deal with hard questions and that we don't return to trying to, to lessen the scope of the real um, difficulty that people are wrestling with every day. That's great. One last question here before we get out. Uh, where can people follow your work and read your writing? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of following our work collectively, um, Double Love Experience Church is the church that we co-lead together. Um, and all of our ministry has a virtual component. So you do not have to be in New York. Um, to take advantage of that. And so you can follow us on social media or you can visit our website. Um, on a personal level, um, my Instagram and my Twitter are at Dr. Gabby C. Wilkes. Um, I'm a contributing writer for Faith and Leadership Magazine. Um, I do some blogging every now and again on Medium. Um, and I've written for a few other places. So you can just throw my name in Google and it'll come up. Thank you so much for, for the question. I uh, appreciate you uh, dropping in uh, double love in, in the chat, Josiah. Um, 
my um Instagram and, and Twitter is um at Andrew J. Wilkes. Uh have the, the pleasure of uh collaborating uh with with Josiah from from time to time on, on, on writing articles on uh Christianity and Black radical tradition things for, for sojourners. Um would also um note that um among a number of um different uh outlets and, and articles uh i have always appreciate and, and hope folks here appreciate um this space that um religious socialism creates for uh infrastructure for inspiration for um creating a more generous and capacious spirituality than uh than, than some of us have found at um other congregations of the community context and so have, have had the joy of uh, helping to facilitate a number of conversations uh, uh, in concert with religious socialism over the years. And so we'll, we'll point folks to some of those. He also has a book that precedes this one, which he didn't mention, but it's called Freedom Notes. Oh. Um, so that's that's a book that you will enjoy as well. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you to DSA for facilitating this. And this was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you to Andrew and Gabby. Uh, do buy their book, continue to follow their work. Uh, really appreciate everyone's participation and I hope you all have a great evening. All right, bye-bye. Good night, thank you all. Good night, everyone.